to welcome everybody. Thank everybody for coming. My name is Akiva Bergman. I live in Far Rockaway and uh, I've been practicing internal medicine for the past 15 years. I start my day rounding every day in the ICU in the ventilator unit. I uh, run a very large internal medicine practice and deal almost on a daily basis with questions that come up, both medical and social, with uh, families dealing with uh, elderly parents, elderly family. Uh, my, uh, the, the, the biggest uh, comment that I have in my mind is that uh, in addition to being a physician, I've been a proud parent in Shiva Dafri Torah for 15 years now. And at every event in Shiva Dafri Torah from first grade, 3-1-A, straight through, the Rosh Hashiva Rabbi Bender uh, has one comment, one mantra that all of us uh, know. And it's an uh, exhortation to the older generation to involve themselves with the younger generation. And Rabbi Bender makes the point that when he was younger, and uh, many of you sitting here were younger, there was no such thing as a great-grandparent, and many did not have grandparents at all. My parents did not have grandparents. And when I first heard this from Rabbi Bender, I myself was uh, in my young 20s, my parents were in their 50s, and my grandparents were just around 70. Now hearing this uh, many years later, I have a 95-year-old grandmother, my parents are both over 70, and there's now a uh, concept of even a great-great-grandparent that is becoming more and more in style. And uh, with that, and uh, the large numbers of the older generation of grandparents, great-grandparents, great-grandparents, just makes this issue much more prevalent and much more common than it was even 10 years ago. The questions themselves are very, very, very sensitive. They border on very sensitive medical questions. They border on very sensitive family dynamics within kids, between parents, between siblings, between the siblings and the parents, sensitive halachic issues of keep it of aim, intertwined with the medical issues, with the medical uh, concepts, and therefore it's really a uh, growing area of exploration and something that Rosh Yeshiva and Rabbanim have to deal with on a, on a daily basis and questions keep, uh, keep arising. I uh, would like to start the session with a, uh, a general question. I have questions, if you have any specific questions, please jot them down. I'll hand out uh, index cards for any of you who raise your hand any specific questions you want to you wanna bring up. Um, I will address each question particularly to one of our esteemed panelists and to introduce uh, Rabbi Bender, who I think in this venue may view himself as the father of the famous Rabbi Bender, uh, the famous Rabbi Baruch Bar Bender, um, Achi Hazer, and uh, Rosh Shiva Shiva Dachitar in Farakwe, and Rabbi Tzvi Flam, who's been a uh, rub for many, many, many decades, is a world-renowned expert, particularly in the area of medical halacha. I remember I discussed my first shayla as a medical student with Rabbi Flam, a, uh, a, a shayla that had not been printed in Svarim came up, and I spent a few weeks researching it, and I met with Rabbi Flam in his house, and without batting an eyelash, without uh, resorting to opening up Svarim, he dissected okay, the shayla okay. very clearly, and uh, is somebody with uh, much, much knowledge and life experience on his fingertips. I will address each question particularly to either the Rosh Hashiva or the Rav, um, and uh, then we could, uh, either of you have uh, to jump in on the other's question, that's, that's fantastic, and feel free to uh, add anything that the Tzibur may benefit from. Uh, I'll back off now for a second to the, to the side. Uh, so Rabbi Bender. A very, very, very common shayla, and uh, really the theme here is, and I uh, just got a question from the crowd right before we started of uh, a similar question. Uh, an elderly parent who had been very independent throughout life and had uh, been the role of the caregiver for the rest of the younger family has now aged, and dementia has uh, begun to set in. One illness after another has come. The parent has been hospitalized more frequently, and during the latest hospitalization, the decision has been made that it is really not safe for the parent, unwise for the parent, to return home without any advanced care. And the decision now to be made by the children are, is whether the parent should go to a nursing facility, whether the parent should be brought home with 
nursing care, sometimes quite expensive, not covered by insurance, or whether the parent should be brought to live with one of the children themselves. This is really a very question, I think, more than my question. I, I, I'll, I'll give me a shkafik out for a few minutes. Uh, it's really a very flam question, I think, and I, I, I'd like to defer to our flam. You've seen this very much. I just want to say that I, I grew up in a home where Kibbutz was was primary, and uh, there was nothing more important than that. I fought, my grandfather lived in Eretz and um, my grandfather moved to Eretz in 1948 when the state was founded. He got married a second time, and he moved to Eretz Yet, we felt as my grandfather was literally living with us because that my father, who was an only child, was busy with my fa- with our grandfather constantly. How? He would write my grandfather, we didn't, we didn't call her so in those years, we didn't, we didn't speak with 20 miles for three minutes, and you couldn't hear the other side very well, you couldn't, you couldn't even talk. But when you did, you wrote letters, letters, is, for people don't know what letters are anymore, today's emails, or, or WhatsApp, you don't really have anything to write with. But, my father had us write one letter a week to the Zayda. That, there was a, these large blue email letters, you had to fill up the entire letter, plus both flaps. And he said, Daddy, what should we write about? He said, what, you ate for breakfast? I mean, that was a lot. What ate breakfast? You know, what, 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 what happened in school, who's your rabbi, who's your teacher, what you do, etc. And he trained us. To, my grandfather came twice, 1956, 1961, until my father passed away in 1965. We were quite young, my father passed away. And my grandfather came twice, and he knew exactly everything about us. For example, um, if I ever got a good report card, once in a while, so we had to return report cards those days. Today, you get, a, you get a, in the computer, they send you on one or You didn't bring it in, you got penalized. My father was the principal, and he got penalized. If I got a good report card, all kidding aside, he'd send us straight there to Israel. And when my grandfather came to live with us for eight years after my father passed away, you should know that um, he brought along all those report cards. We didn't own a camera. The photographer would come to the house, and he'd come with this, this tripod, a, a box with a black curtain and a, and a bulb at the end, and he'd send back one photo for us, and that photo was nice, straight there to Israel. So by me, I treasured always the fact that I had one grandfather, as Dr. Bergman, thank you for your kind words, by the way, we said before about lack, lack of grandparents, I had one grandfather, and I treasured that relationship with him. Chavis Alvavis once said, Chavis Alvavis is one of the most important work of ethics. He says the following, in the Shara Bukhina school, uh, he says the following, he says, it's a question, why is it that we love children? Babies, we love them. What, what do kids do all day long? You know, they cry, they scream, they yell. They want food immediately, they're spoiled, they're getting it from their mother like that for nine months straight, and they want it right away, they, excuse me, they, they, they dirty their diapers, and, and we love them. They're cute, and they're adorable, my mother used to say, on the dirty diapers, perfume, it's wonderful, yeah? Not always perfume, but okay, you know, perfume. You have elderly people who have helped us their entire lives, and taken care of us their entire lives, it's hard to take care of them. That's why facilities are very fond, we'll speak about it, I think are extremely important to facilities. I, I, I've not seen that people are able to take care of their person that you mentioned before, the example that you used before, I have not seen really uh, um, tremendous yeah. success with that. Many people cannot handle it at home. Again, like I said, Rafael will speak about it. But why is it we don't take care of the elderly? We don't want to take care of the elderly. We can't die for them. We can't take care of them. Why is it? What's the reason for that? He answered a very fascinating answer. He said, if children, Akarish Baruch Hu, Hashem gave a certain chayim and charm to kids. If he hadn't, we, 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 we would not want to take care of children. And the elderly, he says, the opposite. Hashem, whatever the reason it goes into, had to make it that way. But the point is, elderly should be our number one priority. And I want to leave you one story I heard many years ago. If it's true or not, I don't know. But I like to say it over anyway. So it was once a gentleman, by the way, we're also living, I prepared that shkafi thing to say about, so very, very briefly, it's a very difficult time in the hospital today in some places. I think the Obama administration set a new pattern, a new tone. They're really 75 years old is enough to live. And, and you're 75 already, you know, you had a good life, move on. And they had an effect, I think, on the American society at large. That when you get too old, you know, forget about it. And it's wrong. It's wrong because we're going to be old one day. And we want people to take care of us. Hopefully we'll take care of ourselves. You want that. So I want to tell a story of the child. May I heard of my father could be because he was so strong in helping the elderly. Um, that there was once a fellow that um, he, he had an old mother, dementia, Alzheimer's, very bad shape, and he had a little girl at home, an eight-year-old girl, and he packed her into a box. And he said, let's go for a ride, the little girl. He says, Daddy, what are you doing with your grandma? She said, don't worry, she doesn't, she doesn't do anything, it's good for her. And he put her into a box, and a big trunk, 
and she left the trunk into his car, and he's off the way, and this girl screaming, what are you doing to grandma? Grandma's in the box, don't worry. He drives up to a bridge, and, and he says, you know, grandma's suffering, you see what goes on in the house. You know what goes on, we can't take care of her, and, and it's impossible. She knows nothing what's going on, so the best thing would be to throw her over. That'll be the end of the story. Why should she suffer like that? We're having a very hard time. That's one thing, but she's suffering. Having a very, very hard time. And the girl says, but that's grandma. You can't do that to grandma. He said, but you say, grandma is suffering. We can't let it go on. So finally the girl snaps. She says, you know what, daddy? Do me a favor. You want to throw her over, throw her over. But leave the box for me. And, and daddy says, why? It's much nicer. You say Yiddish, but cover them. No, but I want to keep the box for you, Daddy. Mm -hmm. And and this is a true story. This I heard of my father many, many, many years ago. If it's true or not, I don't know. But you know what? Let's say it's true. Kids like to. The, is it true? It's true. <laughs> That's the way some of you treat our elderly, and I think it's important to treat our elderly. But let's consider ourselves in that spot. So I think that that's what we have to look at today. If we can help our elderly, if we can help our parents, it's critical. I, I'm very proud that my wife is sitting in the back. Um, where she took care of her elderly parents. I grew up, my mother-in-law lived with us, and it wasn't easy at all times. She really, my wife, I must say, the last five, six years of my in-law's life didn't go anywhere. She went nowhere, but you know what? My children grew up in a home where they saw how my wife was treating my in-laws. <laughs> the, the, the midos that my children developed, my young kids developed in those years, when they observed how she was taking care of her parents, it makes them into better people. It's a win-win-win situation. But at times, obviously, and I encourage that very much, we have to put a person into a home, but go visit them. I used to visit an old, and this is not, I'm, I'm finishing with that now. Um, I used to visit an old aunt of mine, an old uncle of mine in a nursing home. So my wife and I and the kids would go every Friday to visit them. I can't begin to, I'm sorry Mr. Freeman to tell you more stories. I can't begin to tell you, we made friends. I went for four years every Arab Shabbos to visit. So we decided not only will we visit my uncle and aunt, we'll visit other people. I cannot begin to tell you how many people told us maybe we see our children twice a year. Thanksgiving, Christmas maybe. It was Mother's Day, of course. Yeah, it's unfair. So there are times for everything, as very fond will speak about now, there are times for everything, but I think we have to take care of our children, be it at home or wherever it might be, let's take care of them. Okay. <coughs> Following in a, a little uh, bit of the Mahalo. Uh, I will not answer that long in the future, that was just a shot, so. Okay. Following a little bit in the Mahalach, my dear colleague, Rabbi Bender, I just want to put a little perspective over here because I think we jumped into it, but I want to give us a little structure. What is interesting to note, and people sometimes don't realize this, is that when the Rambam formulated in his Mishnah Torah in the Sefer of Halacha, and helped us around with the Halachas of Kibbut of Aim, he prefaced it with a very important Hashkafis Chazal. And that is the Chazal tell us the Rabbanu Shalom made an equivalency between the Mora of a covered we are supposed to give to the Rabbanu Shalom and the Mora and Kavod we're supposed to give to our parents. And the question is why did the Ramam do that besides the fact Chazal tell us? When you look in the Gemara, what you find quite interestingly is the attitude of the Tanayim and the Amarayim when it came to having their parents live with them at home during the time of their, of their older years. To give you an example of how far the Tanayim and Amarayim used to go, when they used to hear the footsteps of the senior citizen parents coming into the house, Chazal tell us a Godel like Rav Yosef used to stand up before he even saw his mother. Because he says, when my mother comes into this house, it's as if the Rabbanu Sholem Shechina is coming into this house. And the same way I would stand in front of the Rabbanu Sholem Shechina, Divine Presence, I'm going to stand in front of my mother's presence because she represents Hashem Shechina, Divine Presence, entering my abode. They looked upon their parents as if Kaviyachal, the Rabbanu Shalom, was coming. There are many Midrashi Chazal that tell us that the Rabbanu Shalom makes a determination of whether or not he wants his Shechina, his Divine Presence, to exist in your house. 
God wanted ultimately every Jewish home to be a miniature temple. And Hashem wanted His Shechina to dwell in your abode. But Chazal tell us that makes one major prerequisite. That you treat your parent as if Kaviyochel, you're giving covet to the Rabbanu Shalom. If the Rabbanu Shalom sees you're giving covet to your parents, especially your elderly parents, Hashem says, this is the abode I want to dwell in. And if Chas V'Shalom, the Gemara says, people are not showing the proper covet and respect to the grandparents or to the senior citizens in the home, they show disrespect and disdain or disregard. But Rabban Hashem says, I want nothing to do with this type of Jewish household. This is not the miniature temple I wanted to be created. And literally, he takes away his divine presence from that specific location. From that mind of Chazal alone, you could obviously already see intuitively, Chazal looked upon the presence, therefore, of an, a senior citizen parent in the house as a special manifestation of God's divine presence. After all, we're all created with Tzalem Elohim, and a grandparent who's been around a long time has shown the positive thing spiritually and otherwise. You can do with that Tzalem Elohim, but that the Panei Zakin is one of the mitzvahs we have in the Torah, to give them cover not only for their knowledge, but for their life experience and all the stuff that they've done during their lifetime. And therefore the Rabban Lushalm expects us to give them the same kavod when it comes to our dealings with them. That's number one. Number two, what is quite interesting, and I always found this fascinating, is when the Gemara itself describes the concept of covid vimora which means more means a certain amount of, of awe and respectability you're supposed to give your parents, and then defines right afterwards the mitzvah of giving them kavo, giving them respect. I always thought, before I saw the Gemara, that quite obviously giving them reverence and respect is one thing, and there are many ways of doing it, getting up for them, and quite obviously not sitting in their seat, not contradicting them or showing disrespect to them. So showing Mara is a pretty, pretty seichaldic thing you're able to figure out based upon simple common sense. When it came to Kavod, what I find fascinating is the examples given to the Gemara. The Gemara says, what's a manifestation of Kavod? Machal, if you have to feed them. Mashka, if you have to give them what to drink. Malbish, if you have to help them get dressed. Motzi, be able to take them in and take them out physically, help them maneuver themselves. The Gemara gives that as examples of what covet is. Now, in that context, the covet is not just showing respect for a parent, but if you think about it for a couple of minutes, what it demonstrates is maintaining the self-respect of a parent that their own children, who they gave their life for, who they brought up, who whatever they did, I always say to people, you don't realize what keep it up a means until you get married and have your own children. And when you start realizing what you do as a parent for your child, from the diapering and everything else, and losing sleep and etc., all of a sudden, in retrospect, you start saying to yourself, I now realize what my parents did to me. At that time, I was too young to appreciate it. But in retrospect, you start understanding what covet is all about. By the fact that Chazal formulated covet in such a context, what it appears is that Chazal expected that when a person has a parent who's an elderly parent, who's incapable of eating and drinking and dressing themselves and moving themselves, that your kibbutz of aim number one, your first line of defense, is to either to go to their home and take care of them in their home, and if that's not a, not a possibility, to surely bring them into your house and take care of all their physical needs and necessities, but they're covered, because when the parent gets it from a child, it's a different type of, 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 of covered and respect than if a stranger does it. And what the parent sees is that the ultimate concept behind the concept of Kibar Avim, Chazal tell us, as the Sefer Chinuch mentions, is the concept of Akara Satov. To show them we appreciate what you did for us, and we are reciprocating that Hakara Satov 
to give you back as much as we possibly can and show respect to you and love for you and appreciation for what you've done to us as a major principle Hakkara Satov. Rabbi Bender mentioned the Chavis HaLavavas and the fact of the matter is he knows as well as I do it was probably one of the most major Musa Svarim that were ever learned in the Yeshiva Shavelt. He was one of the great Rishonim the Ben Bach Yibn Vekuda and what he says in his Sefer that the most important principle in Kol HaTarakula what is the most important principle? Hakaris HaTov and he says when you develop a Hakaris HaTov for your parents and fine-tune it that in turn allows you to develop a Hakaris HaTov for the Rabbanu Shalom and that is why he says when the Rabbanu Shalom gave us the Aseris HaDibras and he prefaced it with Anach Hashem Elokech on top and he put Kibar Ava'im on the Bein Adam Lamakim side rather than on the Bein Adam Lachavero side is because the Hakaris HaTov of one's parents is supposed to give you such a sensitivity to then bring you to Hakara Satov of the Rabbanu Shalom. That's why Hashem gave an equivalency of covered for the Malra to Hashem and covered Mara to her parents because they basically, on a symbionic level, give each chizuk when it comes to the performance of that mitzvah. So, therefore, on a simple level, there's no question that when a parent would obviously need physical help and Baruch Hashem, they're not hospitalized. Baruch Hashem, they don't have to be placed into a nursing home. You have the physical capacity and the co-op to take care of their needs and necessities. There's no question that they should be brought to you in your house. This is your golden opportunity to show them the hakaras that tell you have for all the years of love and compassion and mysterious nefesh they showed for you. So that's the easy case where they can be taken care of in your home. You have the ability it's great for you, it's great for the children and grandchildren to be able to see how a child gives cover to their parents, you're giving a misora to your children. What is expected when it comes to parent-child relationships? It's a chinuch education, much more than you can learn in a sefer in the yeshiva. You see it live. And what's interesting and fascinating when you look at, at the bigger picture, Chazal say, when you have an older parent in a house, some of the vice is like you have a treasure. It's like you have an incredible treasure. Because this person, who is the grandparent of the family, the grandmother or the grandfather, the patriarch of the mishpacha, what they have to share, not only with the children, with the grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and what they did in their lifetime and what they accomplished, you have the ultimate mice of a similar banim. You have the legacy during the lifetime being given over with oral discussions and stories and things like this that the children should know from where you come from. Because Chazal say, if you know where you came from and where you stem from and the hashkafa of the grandparents and their grandparents, if you know where you're coming from, then you know where you're headed to. It gives you spiritual direction. The big problem, however, arises when the physical capacity of the children at home don't have the technical knowledge or ability to deal with certain types of medical problems which the parent might have. So in that case, you then have the next choice. And the next choice is, if you don't have that physical capacity, many times, Baruch Hashem, we have family home <coughs> services now that have people who have been trained in specialists, whether the nurses or whatever, or, or people who are medical personalities, that you can hire to come to your house to take care of the medical needs, but at least they're in your house. The professional activities that have to be done for them are done by these professionals. They come uh, based upon being sent, and Baruch Hashem, Medicaid, Medicare, all of that stuff takes care of it. My mother Nebuch had fallen down, she broke her ribs. Instead of her having to stay in the hospital, Baruch Hashem, they said, we can give you that same loving care in the house itself, and there are professionals coming each and every day. Some of them are therapists, physical therapists. Some of them are nurses. Everybody doing their thing, but it's in a family loving setting. You don't have to be in a hospital to have that type of care. And that they basically complemented and supplemented by the children being there makes this a very comfortable situation. When it comes to the concept of what happens despite all of this, 
that you can't, unfortunately speaking, have the ability to take care of your parent in the house because of the level of the sickness that they have. And the inability to set up a miniature hospital necessarily in a person's home. And they have to go to a hospital. Or perhaps they have to be, not if they're not a hospital, in some type of nursing care facility. So when it comes to that specific level, the question is, how did Chazal deal with it? So in the Shulchan Aruch and Simen Reish Mem in Yerodeya, where you have the halachas of Kibarov, a mentionary specifically, the Shulchan Aruch says, an example given by the, by, the, by the Gemara, which the Shulchan Aruch quotes, Misha'av ve'imo nitrafa daito. If the parents have developed psychological, emotion, physiological problems that cannot be adequately dealt with the children, and therefore the children feel if they keep the parent in the house, they're not doing them a favor because they can't medically, psychologically, emotionally take care of these needs that the parent has by having even home help because it's reached a certain state that they need certain type of institutional ongoing supervision on an ongoing basis. So then you come to the permissibility which the Rambam Paskins and which is brought down by Rav Yosef Karel and Machab and Shulchan Aruch and Hilchus Kibbut of Aim, that you're allowed to put the parent in some type of institutional setting. But now you have the million dollar question. And the million dollar question is, what facility do you put them in? How do you choose which facility has the best type of facility, has the most loving care, has a proper nursing staff, has a proper medical staff, that you're going to feel that if you're not around, the covet and the respect and the dignity that your parents are supposed to have will take place specifically in that type of facility. One thing is for sure, not all facilities that are called nursing uh, care centers and nursing homes are 100% exactly alike. You got to do your research and development. You got to literally do a tremendous analysis by asking other people who've had similar situations where they housed their parents under such circumstances to make sure you're putting them in a covered dikamakim and a responsible place and not putting them in a place that is simply hefker. I've had, since I was a Rav for many, many years and I was involved, quite obviously as a Rav, I'm still involved in Bika Cholim. Many times the Bika Cholim means going to nursing homes besides hospitals and visiting patients, visiting people who you're about about them, visiting people who could obviously are there. And I can tell you, no two nursing homes are exactly alike. Baruch Hashem, we have over here in the audience a head of a nursing facility who has multiple parts, who Baruch Hashem, in his facility, I can tell you, there is quality control, there is religiosity, there's spirituality, there's covid, there's respect, anything you would want when it comes to a paradigm as it relates to the concept of what a nursing facility should be exists in this specific facility. Gerwin, by the way. Gerwin, Gerwin is the name of the institution. I don't know if you want to be to publicize it. Why not? We're gonna, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna publicize it. It might be, Ger, Gerwin is the name. It might be a little far out, but one thing I will tell you, it fits the bill. But one thing I want to forewarn you, not everybody can go there, not everybody is able to go there, but whatever you choose, you have to make sure that this place has a reputation, this place has, has a track record, you have to continually visit, that doesn't exempt you as a child from your coming and giving your parents the support that they need. You have a right to use them. I can add one thing before, before I break, you don't mind, I don't cut no, you off, but... Uh, please. Gerwin is Gerwin, we all know. They have number one, really, they really are. Um, I think it's most important to stay on top of the care. And that's in hospitals too, by the way. The more you visit, my mother Lashon was sick for so many years. We came there nights and days, nicely, with their Heretz, respectfully. By being there and showing the nurses you care, either in a hospital or facility, it changes the entire anhaga of the staff towards your parent. It's critically important and very, very important to let them know that you're there for them at all times, really. Okay. I just want to add to what Ravendra just said, though, because this is an important factor as well. And that is, you know, in different facilities, people are in different levels of sickness. And quite obviously, people are, are, are invalids. But some people, they get on with age, and quite obviously, they get sicker and sicker. And quite obviously, they need more, more medical help. 
And unfortunately, people sometimes have a tendency because they want to get something off their mind, and the facility says, do us a favor, give us a medical directive, and maybe even give us a DNR, uh, you know, basically designation. Do not resuscitate. And I'm talking now as a halachist, as a person medically in the field, who deals with this 24-7, literally. And I want you to know the following, and I, anybody who's a doctor here, you'll forgive me, but I'm giving reality of what I've seen and what I've experienced. The DNR order is not something you give when you put a person in this facility as a given. Giving a health, uh, we call a living will, or some other type of health proxy, only means that you're designating certain people, mishpacha members, rabbinical personalities, or rabbinical organizations, that if God forbid something's happening, we're dealing now with God forbid a change of their health, life and death might be imminent, so you have these experts and these people have been designated to make a lot of medical decisions for you if you're not capable of doing it. So if everybody wants to have a health care proxy, that's an important factor, because you never know what's going to happen to a person from day to day as they get older. But that does not mean you have to sign a DNR. That truly doesn't mean that you sign a do not treat. Everybody lives and dies in a different type of way. The DNR, do not resuscitate, or stopping a person when it comes to uh, medical treatment at a certain point in time, is a very subjective phenomenon. In the Shulchan Aruch, when it's brought down in Shem Alam test in Yeridea, it's talking about a person already is a moribund patient, a gosess, who's going to die within a couple of days. At that juncture, the phenomenon of a DNR, of what to do when it comes to giving them what Chazal call a Misa Yafeh, comes into halakhic existence. Rav Arbach Zatzal, Rav Yoshev, based upon the Pasuk, the Yahavta, Recha, Kamocha, Paskin, that you have to give a person when they die a Misa Yafeh. A Misa Yafeh means the most respectful, but cover the death they possibly can not to mucha them, but to allow nature to take its course at a certain juncture in time. To give a person a DNR and to make these types of the, the decisions when the person is still chai v'kayam and has kalkas and energies is inappropriate because when the staff sees that that's what you have done, I'm going back to Rabbi Bender, when you basically demonstrate that you've given up and the person is even not even sick yet, what you're really saying to the medical staff is we don't really care that much anymore and therefore they don't give the type of quality care they should be giving. And this I've seen across the board over many, many years of experience. So be very careful when to sign a DNR. Don't do it yourself. You have to ask a Sheila Varav, who's an expert who knows medicine, who knows halakha, who knows exactly when that type of decision can be made. Even when you give a DNR, that does mean that you basically stop treatment because of Moshe Feinstein of Avrach Paskin Talach Lamasa, even though there might not be when a person is in a hospital and deathly ill, and perhaps he's, they're going to die shortly, even though you might stop medical treatment as chemotherapy or radioactive therapy, things like that, because it's no longer medically effective, has, it doesn't have any therapeutic benefit, there's still a concept of biological maintenance to the end, which means you have to give them food and drink even artificially, you have to give them morphine, painkillers, they need oxygen assistance, you have the oxygen assistance. Whatever you can to give them biological maintenance, but they're covered, you have to do to the end. The fact you no longer have to medically treat them with heavy types of medical care, which no longer is effective, is one thing. But to give them the dignity of eating and drinking, even artificially in pain management, that they should have a misiyafe, that these gadolim require all the way to the end. That's why, and even if a person size a DNR, emphasize this does not mean do not treat I mean and you spell out this is a special section there where you can tell them exactly what you want to continue even though if they go into cardiac uh, and respiratory arrest because of the ultimate culmination of the disease nevertheless you want them treated to the end whatever is positive and constructive for them session is a microcosm of this topic uh, we have five minutes left uh, and uh, there is uh, worlds uh, to discuss, many questions, excellent questions. I've thought, one minute per each, question. Each of which, yes. So I'm going to throw out just uh, the few minutes we have left. Uh, Maki Ezer has told me that Rabbi Flammer, my vendor's uh, contact information is available through them. Everybody is encouraged. Uh, if you have follow-up questions for one of the panelists, please feel free to reach out to them. But of course, 
everybody should uh, address each of these questions with your own rabbi, your own uh, consultants within the family. It's a larger discussion. It's not a five-minute discussion. It's not a one-hour discussion. It's hours and hours and hours of levels of complication with each one of these questions. Um, each of the questions that came up are important, and I wish that we had uh, the rest of the day to uh, properly address them. Just to throw out for the few minutes remaining, uh, question, uh, start with Rabbi Bender. So, with the, uh, with the idea of the importance of taking care of parents, it's not always a simple cut and dry question and the serious nefesh for a parent. Very often, uh, it could come at one of two expenses. There's often a second parent who's living at home, and what is right for one parent who is a little bit more ill or perhaps more demented ahead of the other parent, getting proper help, a proper assistance for the ill parent comes at expense of the well parent. And the well parent has their own feelings and they feel that the proper help may be an imposition for them. For example, getting an aid for a demented parent and the well parent doesn't want an intrusion, doesn't want another person in the home. How to balance that? And the second question is, with the children, it, there are, are times when properly taking care of the parent, uh, bringing them into the home, etc. while very often it's a beautiful thing for the younger children, there could be family situations where it's a drain and it's a strain on the, on the parent or the child in this case. Um, how do you balance the need of taking care of the ill or demented parent versus a well parent and other personal considerations? You, you really cannot do justice to this question in, 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 in 20 minutes. It's really very difficult. Right? Flam touched on some, but I, I go very quickly a few of them. Um, I believe that when there's two parents, the right way to go is to convince the parents to split the bedrooms. In other words, is to have the A be with the parent that needs to have the continual help. Uh, the A should be together with that person, and the other parent should sleep constantly in the other room without uh, being put upon. That's the higher, the, that's, that seems to be the easiest way to do it. As far as children, I have found over the years involve the children. Give them chores, what to do. If you involve the children, I think a lot of your problems with the children will go away. They can do many things to help out their parents, their, their grandparents for this. So I think that each case is different, obviously. So to answer two of those points, when there's a, a parent in the house, most of the time, by the way, if there was a loving relation between the parents, they will understand, but splitting the bedroom, I think, would be the best way to go. I'm giving you a quick answer, obviously, if you want to answer more questions. So, uh, wait. Um, one other question that came from the crowd is whether a uh, daughter has more of a responsibility than a son to help the parent. The halakha la is that Chazal never, never discriminated between men and women when it comes to this. And the fact of the matter is everybody has talents and uh, Sometimes you want your daughter to be there, sometimes you want your son, sometimes you want both of them to hey, be Flam, there. Hey, Flam, the women are much nicer than us, face to face. <laughs> they really are. All right, uh, much nicer. Uh, 100% they're nicer. Well, <laughs> one thing is that, that motherly instincts, which could obviously make them a little more, could obviously Maritza. But I don't want to negate the men as well to free them from having any responsibility. They go to work. Uh, they go to work. Yeah, the fact of the matter is you have both parents going to work today, which makes it even more complicated. Right. Mother's not always home. But I will say the following, there's an equal responsibility. Chazan never differentiated between males and females when it came to this. Pragmatically, it might be that the wife might, or the women might be, have more availability, more time, and quite obviously more sensitivity. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's based upon the pragmatic reality of how that home runs, and basically there are other responsibilities. I think the men also can deal with some of the personal hygiene. Yeah. The women are able to do that much better. Yeah. A suggestion, if all these would have handicapped kids, where the boys in high school take other kids to the bathroom and excuse me, excuse me, wipe them and clean them, etc. They'd be fine when they get older also. It's a very healthy thing. We have that yeshiva. A lot of, a lot of boys are handicapped. Other boys take them and take care of their personal needs. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. They get trained they get older. I mean, we have, there's an organization, Kids for Courage, which never have kids that have all of these problems. The boys and girls who come along to help and the girls take care of the girls when it comes to these types of problems, the boys take care of the boys. Wonderful. And they learned and they grow with this and quite obviously they show incredible chesed. Next question uh, from the crowd was that uh, a parent needs a certain level of care and can the child use the parent's money to provide that level of care or the child have to <coughs> spend on their own? Number so, two question, more advanced yeah. question, is that Let's say a parent can be taken care of with a certain base level of care. 
but it would make the child's life easier to get more care, to hire extra care, to buy meals for the parents rather than buy them, to the parents for the basic obligation, can the child use the parents' money, and for the extra comfort, which would, is not needed for the basic parents' care, but is to make the child's life easier, where can that money come from? So the fact of the matter is there's an explicit Gemara and Kedushin that asked the question. When it came to the question of feeding, clothing, and doing everything like that, the Gemara asks very explicitly, does this come from the child's money or the parent's money? The Psaq given in the Shulchan Aruch and Simon Reish Mem, like the Gemara Paskins, initially it comes for the parental money if the parent has money. That's where the resources come from, and that's what should be used first before anything else. The Shulchan Aruch then says that what happens if the parents used up that money or don't have that type of money, at that juncture, the responsibility then is thrown upon the children. Uh, the children should look upon this no worse or less than any other concept of charity that you would be willing to give. And the Ramos is very explicitly in Shulchan Aruch and Reish Mem that if all the children have a, what we call a similar financial capacity, they should equally share the expense amongst themselves. If there are richer children and perhaps poorer children, and those who can afford it more, they should then divide it proportionally. But there's no question that that incumbency is thrown upon the children if the parents do not have a wherewithal. It's a very subjective thing to say what's needed, what's above and beyond the call of duty. The fact of the matter is initially the parental resources are what initially used. At that point in time afterwards, once it comes to the child being able to supply, the fact of the matter is the parents did not make a cheshbin, this love I'm going to show you and this amount I'm going to spend upon you and this I'm not going to. If it's part of HaKar HaSetov, the same way they didn't make those type of calculations this is of your upbringing, you shouldn't make those calculations when it comes to them. I've been informed that the session has come to a close.